Okay. If you haven't had enough of me from previous session, then you have one more. Um, so today I'm going to talk about serverless, right? Uh, serverless computing, how can we do it? We're going to do it in Kubernetes. It's going to be all open source. Actually, it's going to be all CNCF. Uh, only projects from the foundation, right? And uh, I'm going to skip the introduction because you already saw me before, and let's talk about it, right? So the way I see or interpret uh, serverless computing is basically a couple of key points there. First, the, first of all, it's not serverless. There are servers, right? But you don't care about those things. You don't care about servers. That just somehow happens, or it's very, very easy to happen, right? From developer perspective, basically, they should be able to say, here's my source code, and that's it, right? The only thing, really, that I need to give you is source code, and you are going to figure out what to do with it. And what to do with it can be, hey, maybe it should be built as a container image, uh, it should be run, uh, it should scale up, it should scale down, and so on and so forth, right? Or if you want a short version of serverless, that's, uh, that can be interpreted as do not ask me too many questions, just run the thing, right? Uh, whatever the thing is. And the thing is actually not whatever the thing is, the thing is your code. Now, what I'm going to use today is uh, open function. Anybody familiar with open function? So think of open function uh, as a CNC project that is more of wrapper around some number of technologies than anything else. Basically, uh, if you want to run serverless today, especially if you want to run with CNCF projects, open source, what's or not, you're probably going to run it in Kubernetes. You're probably going to use something like Knative that will scale your applications up and down. You're go going to have to build your images somehow um, and a few other things, right? And open function wraps it all together in a relatively nice package that is easy to install and so on and so forth. Not necessarily easy to debug because you still need to know those technologies when things go wrong, uh, but definitely easy to set up, right? So I have here uh, one example um, of a function defined as uh, open function. By the way, I already have a cluster. Actually, I don't have a cluster. We'll get, we'll get to that, right? But what matters is that this, it might look uh, like there's too much, but actually this is this is extremely short or a small number of lines of YAML that you need to define, right? If you would try to do the, accomplish the same as what you will see today from me uh, without uh, open function, you would probably end up with a couple of hundred lines, maybe even thousand lines of YAML, right? Because you would need to define quite a few things. And in this case, it's relatively easy. Hey, I want, I'm going to have something called open function demo. It's a name, whatever it is. Uh, this is going to be the image. Uh, by the way, this, that image will, is not a built image already. You will see later that image will be built for me. Uh, those are the credentials to my container registry. So that's where, that's where open function will push the image and then pull it wherever it's going to be used. Uh, this is how I'm going to build my image. I'm using today the Open Function Builder Go, which is basically build packs. Um, those things don't matter. What does matter is that here's my source code repo, right? So that's where you should get the source code. That should you, that's where you should get everything you need to make it happen. Uh, and uh, on top of that, the only special thing that I have here uh, is that I'm using state store name, uh, mydb, mydb which is essentially uh, what open function will use to connect to my database, and it will do that through Dapper, which you will see later. And finally, my application exposes port 88. That's all there is to it, right? Now, uh, where was I? Here we go. Uh, now, there are a couple of questions there that still need to be answered. And remember, I, I want developers, I want people, engineers in my organization to be fully autonomous. Right, not to go to whomever is in charge of uh, infrastructure or uh, operations or whatever, fully autonomous. And what that means is that we still need to figure out where will that, those functions, where will 
actually, functions is a wrong name, just to be clear. I think that the project did a really misfavor to itself calling it function. It's not functions. It's simply applications. So where will those applications run? That's something that we still need to figure out. And how are we going to create databases, right? How are we going to manage databases? Because applications themselves sometimes don't need a database, sometimes they do, right? So there are those two pending questions that we need to figure out uh, before we start using open function. So, and to do all that, we need at least uh, four things. The first one is cluster as a service, right? I want somebody to be able to create a cluster without spending seven years trying to figure out, I don't know, AWS or whatever it is, database as a service, and then finally we can get to application as a service, because applications without a database in some cases, and in all cases without the cluster or nothing, and how can we do all that in a secure way? And when I say secure, I mean the most secure possible, and that's nobody can enter the cluster uh, period, right? That's why, after all, that's why we are using GitOps. That's why we have a pool model instead of pushing and so on and so forth, right? So let's start with the, with the beginning, right? Uh, cluster. How are we going to get a cluster? And I have here one example, um, which is cluster AWS to YAML, right? Now, this is, I don't know if any of you is familiar with cross -plane. Anybody tried it before? No? Only one. Two. Huh. Look at it. Uh, so, a short version of what Crossplane does is that it allows us to extend Kubernetes ourselves. Meaning that you can create new API endpoints in Kubernetes and say, hey, this is new API that people will be able to invoke to manage, in this case, clusters, but anything you can imagine, right? And I created that, and this is, uh, this is basically, and I called it endpoint, which is custom resource definition Kubernetes, cluster claim. So anybody can, in my organization, anybody can create a cluster claim. Uh, and I'm calling it here cluster two. Uh, and there are a couple of important things first uh, here. First is uh, selector, right? You can, you can invoke different flavors, and I'm, I'm here saying, hey, I would like to have cluster in AWS, and I would like it to be EKS cluster, right? That's what I really care about. And I don't really know much about VPC subnets and all the madness happening in AWS. I just want it to be there. A um, couple of parameters like, hey, I would like to have medium-sized nodes. And uh, med medium-sized nodes are scientifically defined as bigger than small, smaller than large. Kind of, I, I don't even want to enter into, is it going to be T2 something, something, T3 something, something, or whatever AWS is. I want to start with three nodes. I want to have those namespaces in my cluster. I want to have development and production, and I want that cluster to be production ready. And to be production ready, I need certain things installed in the cluster. One of those certain things is important for this, uh, uh, for this talk today, is that I want open function to be installed, configured, and whatever is needed around it to be there, right? But I don't want to be myself to, who, do, who, who will do it. I want external secrets, which you know what it is because you listened to Whitney explain it earlier, and that's about it, right? The only, the rest is not really that important. What is important is that I'm going to do something now that you should never do in your life, uh, ever, in production. And that something will be executing kubectl, uh, namespace is going to be a team, and I'm going to apply uh, whatever is defined in uh, cluster, what was it, AWS2, right? I'm saying you should never do this yourself, simply because you should be using Argo CD or Flux, uh, you, shouldn't be you shouldn't be accessing cluster yourself, right? That's the security part that I'm ignoring right now. Now, what does matter in this story is that I can take a look at what was created through that YAML, and um, I think the name is, there we go, right? And you can see behind that simple interface that I defined, as a service provider, as a person who actually uh, offers clusters as a service to, to my organization, all those things were created, right? Uh, and that's like Internet Gateway, AWS, Main Route Table Association, uh, Subnets, VPCs, all the shenanigans that you need to run a cluster, but nobody really cares except you. Um, now, this will take probably approximately 20 minutes to create all those resources in AWS. I will not... Uh, 
bother you to wait for that uh, for a very simple reason because uh, I will delete this and I will show you something that I, the same command I executed just with a different name earlier uh, yesterday so that you see the end result of how it looks like creating a cluster. And the end result is, there we go. Okay, so all, same, same definition, same instance, right? You can create as many as you want and you can see that all the resources were created, some in AWS, some of them are directly created resources in that cluster. Everything that you can imagine that you would consider that cluster being production ready is there. Not necessarily here, but you can define what that something is. Um, and uh, if I export uh, kubeconfig uh, to be this one, you can see that uh, this is a, imagine that I created it right now, instead of uh, that you waited for 20 minutes. Uh, what you would get is uh, this, right? Uh, Crossplan is installed, Dapper is installed, external secrets are installed, configured, K native open function, right? It's ready. It's waiting for us. Now, um, what does matter for this uh, conversation is, uh, is that now I, that I have a cluster, I can move to the next phase. The next phase is to figure out how are we going to give people uh, means. Actually, I didn't show you this. I can show quickly if that matters to anybody. Basically, um, this is, nah. Who cares? Nobody cares. Uh, databases, right? Now, we can follow the same pattern with databases. And the pattern is, I'm a person who is an expert in databases, knows how to give, how to manage databases myself. I want to offer it as a, as a service. I'm going to create a new custom resource definition in Kubernetes and define what will be created whenever somebody creates instances of that new interface. And that could look like this, db. Uh, AWS2, right? Uh, again, the same pattern. I'm going to create something called SQL claim. The name is whatever you defined it to be, how you want to call the service that you're exposing. I want a database in AWS and PostgreSQL. Uh, if I set up my account for this demo in, AD in Azure, it could be in Azure, it could be in Google, whatever you want it to be. Couple of parameters that everybody can understand, like this is the version, this is the the size, but then goes slightly beyond that, right? Because just as what I said for clusters, you want the whole package. You don't want, database server by itself is useless. Nobody has use of a database server. Database server with databases inside and some schemas, that becomes somehow useful, right? In this case, I'm saying I want a database inside of that server, once you create it in AWS to be called MyDB, I could have a list there, whatever it is. Uh, the secrets are not that important, except that uh, I have two clusters here, the management cluster, control plane, and the cluster that I just created, the production cluster, or whatever the cluster is. Uh, and I want secrets to be generated in that control plane cluster and pushed to my uh, secrets manager and then pulled into the cluster. That's this configuration. What does matter here, is that I can define and manage, and this will change over time, uh, also to say that they, that server should have this database and should have those schemas, right? Um, in this case, videos and comments, right? It's up to you. And behind the scenes, there will be, you will see that later if I have time, uh, there will be uh, not only components in AWS, but also some users over there, and there will be Atlas, for example, for managing schemas and so on and so forth. Basically, I'm hiding all the complexity from people and exposing only things that matter to them, whatever that something is. And you're in control, basically, what, what that something is. So uh, let's jump and create a database. And I'm going to do that first by going back to my uh, control plane cluster, the cluster from where I'm managing stuff. Um, and I'm going to apply kubectl dash dash namespace. I'm going to apply a database, and we said AWS2, right? And this follows the same, the same pattern. Behind that, um, behind that, uh, SQL claim, I think no, SQL claim, right? Uh, behind that simple interface, a lot of things will happen. 
and you will see maybe if it works, it will, there we go. You, you can see that now it is being created, VPC subnets, some resources will be, uh, some additional Kubernetes resources will be added to that cluster to enable it to, uh, to speak with the database and so on and so forth, right? Whatever, whatever that something is, and just as before, it takes like 10 to 15 minutes, and I have 14 minutes left, so I'm going to destroy this uh, and show you the same thing that I created last night. And that same thing is just called my DB without dash two, right? This is the end result after a bit of time. And you need, remember, you need to remember that uh, you're not doing kubectl apply, you're using Argo CD or Flux or something like that, pushing it to Git, and that is being synchronized over there, right? So my database is there with everything I need in AWS, everything I need in that cluster to be able to talk to the database and all the resources and the schema and blah, 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 stuff, right? It's happening. And now, uh, let me actually, let's, let's see whether this works, just to, for the sake of, um, uh, no, uh, export, let's see, PG, oh, I have it in memory, cool. So I'm going to uh, get, uh, get the username and password and uh, the IP of the database from the control plane cluster, uh, put it in environment variables, if it works, there we go. And I'm going to see whether I can connect to the database. Kubectl run. Oh, I have it from before, so it's easy. I don't need to type. Uh, and you should see me being connected to the database that was just created if I wasn't faking it last night. Come on. Questions? You have anything between once and 57 seconds until it fakes up? Maybe it won't work. Um, hmm. Hmm. Mm, did I guess the name? Ah, there we go. There we go. I'm connected to my database. I can do something like host is uh, pg host and uh, dash user is pg user and dash d is postgres and uh, Port is always by default, far four, three, two. And I should be able, no, what did I do? Ah, okay. I know what I did wrong. Who, somebody's mumbling that they know as well. Who was that? Dollar yeah, dollar sign, ah. So whomever uses Postgres is suffering the same thing that the terminal, Postgres, uh, Terminal is just horrible. PG user does the, the Postgres and dash P54321, and now it's working. There we go. And you can see that I got, first of all, that inside of that server, my DB database was created. It's ready waiting for me. If I connect to that, uh, why, why, Q, there we go. If we connect to that my DB, to that database, uh, we should see the tables being created, those two tables that I mentioned before, the videos and comments and so on and so forth, right? So let me go out, exit, do it again. No, it's Q. Okay, cool. Uh, and probably exit one more time. There we go. Okay, and just as important, uh, Qcuttle namespace uh, a team, I got secret. This is the secret that contains my credentials, my DB password, and I got push secrets. Push secrets are external secrets, uh, external secret operator that basically pushed that those credentials to my, in my case, AWS uh, secret store. And you will see later that those same secrets will be, actually not later, let's do it now. Uh, let's do export kubectl. You can see that if I connect to the second cluster, the one where I'm going to run application, and uh, if I go to the production namespace, get external secrets, the, that was created, there is my DB, and uh, if I do secrets, you should see that that cluster has the my DB secret, um, 
uh, what did I want to say, created or pulled uh, from, from the secret store. Now, okay, now I'm ready to get back to where I started and the get back is, now as a developer, I have everything I need. I have a cluster, I have a database, I can finally go back to the function to this one and say, let's, let's uh, create application, right? Let's do it uh, by saying dash dash namespace is production. I want to apply whatever is defined in function YAML. And uh, now the, now open function, which is a collection of Dapper and uh, Knative and quite a few other tools uh, can do the trick. And doing the trick means get functions. You will see the build state being building, meaning that it got the source code from my repository and right now it is building uh, the first release of the image. And it will do that over and over and over and over and over again every time I um, push some commits to that uh, repository, right? From now on, essentially, uh, all I, uh, no, actually, all I expect people to do is two things. First, uh, write code. Push it to Git and change the version, right? Whenever it detects that you change the version, it will Pull the, pull the source code from the repository, it will be the new image based on the version you specified and that's the only thing you're doing. Node.js, Python, Go, whatever you're writing, does not matter. Um, now, I'm trying to buy myself some time. Uh, it's still building. Now, you cannot blame me for that, uh, but what we can do is uh, I'm going to get the URL of the application, uh, which is just so long that I'm going to fake it and copy it. Um, this will be the, the URL through which I will be able to access the application because it will be accessible through Ingress. And uh, is it still building? Okay, it finished building the image. Now it is starting the application, right? And now I should be able to, uh, to send a request to application. So I'm going to send this one. This basically what matters is that I'm going to send a request to application. That request uh, is going to uh, trigger uh, endpoint in the application itself that will try to store some information in the database and that should be the proof that it's actually connected to the database and working. And if I don't see an error, meaning empty, all cool, it worked. And now if I send another request to the database, you can see that Sorry, not to the database, to the application. It went to the, to the database, it re retrieved the data, everything is connected, everything is working, everybody's happy, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, while waiting for uh, last thing I want to show, among other things, part of open function is uh, Dapper. And what Dapper allows us is to, when writing code of the application, not to think about where is the database, how to connect to it, none of those things. Uh, basically, all the con incoming and outgoing connections from the application to the application are, happen are uh, handled externally. That's, what DAP that's one of the things that Dapper does. And in the source code of the application, this is written in Go, don't worry, I'm not going to scare you today if you're not Go developer. What does matter is that I'm just saying here, without ever reading any secret, any authentication, I'm just saying get the state external of the, uh, uh, the, uh, from Dapper, and Dapper will redirect you to the correct database, whether it's production or staging or this or that, completely relevant. And now, uh, the last thing, uh, namespace production, get pods, what you will see is, uh, oh, actually, just the right moment, right? That's the pod of the application, and uh, right now the status is terminating, right? Because what it detected is that a certain amount of time passed and nobody's using that application, right? So it is scaling to zero. Uh, and then if I would, I will actually, let's, let's do this. Uh, there are no pods right now. If I send another request, it will take a few seconds. I should probably not use nano servers. It worked, the pod was created, right? and you can see that it's running for 12 seconds. If I would sell, 
I think that on average, if there are 100, by default, 100 concurrent requests, it creates one replica. If I would now bomb it with thousands of requests, it would scale the application up. And to, man, uh, to, to deal with all the requests, it would scale it back down to zero if needed. So serverless in your own infrastructure, not your, your self-managed serverless, more or less. And I have five minutes for questions. You feel more comfortable if I give you this slide and then you do ask, no? Anybody? No questions? Are you sure? You want drinks because this is the last session. Is that what's going on? <laughs> yeah? Okay, then I give you five minutes back if nobody wants any questions. Thank you so much.